All right, how's everybody doing tonight? Welcome. We are live. Um, your host, Alex Petikov, as always. Hope everyone is having a great Monday night so far. Doing well. Excited for today's show. Uh, but just a quick reminder, as always, if you guys uh, have you know interest in this kind of stuff, please subscribe, share some of the episodes, check out some of the previous episodes. We had a great talk uh, time last week talking to Leon Thompson, British Columbia, talking about Bigfoot in that area and some of his work and lots of other shows. This is the 29th stream, so definitely getting up there in numbers at this point, almost at 30, which is pretty exciting. So got some real cool shows planned coming in the next month or so. Some real awesome guests. So I'm excited for that. So today we're going to be talking about, uh, as we've done uh, two of these other streams before with uh, Chasing Legends. Uh, as many of you know, we've been filming season one of that. We're going to have on Nash Hoover and Eli Watson and maybe some of the other members of the crew if somebody jumps on in. So until then, guys, uh, let's just... Uh, pop those guys in here let's see all right how you doing eli and nash good how are how is everyone i think nash your mic is off it says there's a mic uh no mic yeah. yeah yeah we heard you when we were first in here so i'm like hopefully the mic hasn't broken since then how's everyone yeah. doing good good chilling yeah so we're now in three separate time zones <laughs> We were in the same time zone for uh, for a while. Obviously, Eli is in California. Nash is in the Midwest. I'm on the East Coast. That's where the three time zones come from. But uh, we just got back from a pretty intense three days in South Louisiana, in New Orleans and South Louisiana, filming an episode on the Rougarou of Cajun yep. folklore for the uh, season one of Chasing Legends, which is pretty exciting. So... As we've done in previous shows, do we want to maybe just take a minute to talk about Chasing Legends, kind of what it is? Uh, folks that have been watching the show probably are somewhat aware, but uh, let's just talk about the first season up until this point, and then we'll we'll talk about the Ruger and maybe some, some other stuff too. Sure. Well, uh, Chasing Legends is a, a show that I created back in 2013. Over the years, we've kind of grown in popularity. Uh, we've shot some stuff. Really nothing that uh, we've always tried to kind of do a proper season, but due to, you know, funding issues or whatever, it just hasn't happened. This year, we were like, you know, let's let's do it. Let's let's get it out of the way. Let's let's make something happen finally. And of course, you know, uh, we went out and shot the first episode and then COVID hit. And it just it definitely made things interesting. Um, but we put together a really, really solid group of people. And we all worked hard and worked through all of the, the, uh, the interesting times of, of trying to shoot a show during COVID and travel during COVID. And it worked out. And we got our four done. And now we get to edit it all together and release it to the world. And you guys can all see the, uh, the craziness that, transpired trying to produce this show yeah absolutely oh, my mic yeah absolutely i mean i think it's it shouldn't be understated as you said uh we started this a couple days before well obviously the preparations were done beforehand but the puck wedgie filming started a few days before massachusetts went into a covid lockdown it was like the last bit of pre-covid times um we didn't do a recap for that episode as this show didn't exist back then but now we're sitting here having completed the first season. We did three episodes during COVID. Obviously, in, in July, it was Arizona talking about the Mogollon Monster. In September, we did Champ of Lake Champlain, which we talked about last month, and now the Rougarou of Louisiana. So pretty awesome. Just congratulations, uh, both of you guys. Obviously, Nash, you know, the guy behind the show originally, uh, you know, was your kind of creation with uh, the, your crew and everything like that. And it's awesome how it's taken on a sort of life of its own and interest. Obviously we did a Kickstarter, we did fundraising and thank you to everyone who supported that. And awesome yes. to have, uh, you know, fellow cryptid hunters and just being out there. So we have Dixie Q says, hello from Southeast Louisiana. Hello. Uh, hey, hope the weather's still pretty warm down there. It's cold up here in New England. We're definitely enjoying some of the humidity down there. <clears throat> 
uh, Crash Course Cryptozoology. Carrick says, awesome map on the wall, Eli. Thank you, sir. It was a gift from my sister. You going to put are there cryptids on there or anything like that? Any new uh, any leads or anything? No. <laughs> any leads? Yeah, these are all my leads. Um, <laughs> this is where I'm going next. You just throw a dart at the wall, and that's where you're going next. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hadn't planned on it. <laughs> cool, cool. Should um, ask, any, uh, see what uh, see what Carrick thinks of our uh, our rogue evidence. <laughs> I don't know if that's on just my end, but is like, did you hear? Did you get a distortion, Eli, at all when he was talking? From when Nash was talking? Yeah, just at the end there. Uh, maybe a little bit, but nothing. Oh, it's, it's probably my. I don't know. My computer's being sort of weird today. I apologize if uh, if anything weird happens, but yeah. So let's talk now about obviously the issue at hand, the Rougarou. So first of all, let's talk about what the Rougarou is. Who wants to go first? Anyone want to give their sort of two cents on what the Rougarou is? So the Rougarou is a basically the Cajun take on the on a, a werewolf, basically. Uh, it's said to live in the swamps. Some say it's physical in form. Some say it's metaphysical and kind of shape shift and uh isn't always looks like we might um, have another crew member joining in but yeah continue uh nash um basically it's a uh sorry i was reading Kirk's comment um <clears throat> yeah it's the basic cajun werewolf some say it's physical metaphysical it kind of uh the guy we interviewed described it not only as just being like a werewolf but it could take the form of other animals sometimes but it's usually you're kind of dog man you know however you want to describe it said to inhabit the swamps uh not not the uh, the best animal you'd want to come across from what we were told uh yeah it goes kind of it ties in with like the uh, the french uh loop guru yeah and stuff of that nature very cool let's just bring jack on in hey jack hey how's it going how do i sound <laughs> Good, good. Uh, you look I like, like your. Nash. I like, I like, I like your photo. <laughs> hey, thanks. I didn't want to set up my <laughs> webcam, so you get Nash. Get N- Nash. <laughs> Nash times two. <laughs> cool, cool. So uh, Jack is our sound guy. He's also one of the guys on the crew, obviously. Um, so he was there with us in South Louisiana. So I'm sure we'll we'll talk to him about some of the stuff too. But. Uh, Eli, I know you guys did a cryptic campfire on the Rougarou. You want to say just a little bit about maybe some of the stuff you heard about the Rougarou? Sure. Um, so the Rougarou has actually turned out to be kind of one of my favorite uh, quote-unquote cryptids. Uh, I mean, it depends really on what, what kind of theory you buy into, whether it's a paranormal creature or a more evolved dog man, if you will. Um, I, I tend to veer more on the paranormal side that it's, Mm. you know, a creature of paranormal nature. Can I back that up? Absolutely not. But that's just kind of what I think. Um, Yeah. I mean, the Rougarou is just one of those things that seems to be carried down from a French tradition tradition. Um, I kind of said this in the episode, which has not yet aired, but. Um, I don't see a logical reason why the Rougarou would have been invented it, in terms of a story as a as a warning to kids, uh, especially because, I mean, we came across gators and enormous spiders and it, just basically everything and anything that wants to kill you out in the swamps. And it just doesn't make sense to me why it would be a sort of, you know, cautionary tale. Yeah, it's not like there isn't enough out in those bayous and swamps to uh, go after you and, and to keep kids scared. But hey, maybe if you grow up with gators and spiders all over the place, maybe that's just not extreme enough. So <laughs> you gotta come up with something like that. But no, you're right. It's interesting. It comes from that sort of that Cajun uh, folklore. Obviously, in France, there's the famous case, the Jeboudan, uh, famous werewolf story. Europe is filled with werewolf stories. You have the Beast of Bray Road. Yeah, Beast, I was going to say, uh, connecting that with like the dogman phenomena in America today, which a lot of people talk about. You have the Beast of Bray Road in Wisconsin, a lot of German immigrants and population in that area. Uh, Michigan dogman, 
supposedly sightings all over the place. I've heard of some even in New Hampshire and Massachusetts in this area. I don't know what to make of it, but I but for me, the Rougarou seems more of one of those like classic werewolf like stories, which was really cool that we got to go down there and research. So maybe let's break down kind of how the trip went and uh, what what our game plan, our attack plan was, and then we'll talk about some of the incidents and and some of the stuff that that happened because this there was a lot that happened. There was definitely a lot that happened. So we'll get it. Literally, into- it literally felt like we were there for like a week and a half. <laughs> it, it was it was so we long. It was, <laughs> it was amazing. So it was three days, right? We flew in on a Thursday, uh, Thursday morning. So we basically had Thursday, we had Friday and all day Saturday, and then we all pretty much took off Sunday morning to our respective parts of the country. Yep. So it was yeah, yeah. You're right. So we uh yeah, so we all flew in uh, this last Thursday morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, all met up. We had a our kind of main uh, what we call like the expert interview uh, Thursday afternoon in New Orleans. So we went to New Orleans. We did our interview, um, then spent the rest of the afternoon and evening kind of exploring the French Quarter and kind of just filming us. Uh, kind of walking around and checking out the city, uh, kind of letting off some steam, enjoying and, you know, taking some time to enjoy it. Thursday was supposed to be a boat ride interview day. And then it just it decided it wanted to, uh, to rain. Yeah. The weather just wanted a torrential. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but we were able to get out into the, uh, the Jean or the, yeah, the Jean Lafette, uh, national forest for a little bit uh, during the day before it really started raining. And then sa- or Saturday was, you know, we had to flip everything around. So we ended up doing our uh, boat ride to the swamps that Saturday. And then we did our night investigation Saturday night. Yeah. Very, very late night investigation Saturday night. It was kind of all, yeah, like you said, we had to do a lot of rearranging. What we usually try to do is spend either a day or two doing interviews and then, you know, uh, either hiking or scouting the area. And then the last day before we head out, we try to do a daytime investigation of the area we're going to do for the night investigation. So it was kind of all over the place because the weather, like I said, just kind of, as you mentioned, just decided to do its thing. So we had to rearrange things. Luckily, we were able to do that. Let's just talk about on Friday. So we interviewed um, Glenn, uh, what was his last name? Thursday. We interviewed Glenn Petrie. Thursday. Yep. Petrie. Petrie. <coughs> yeah. Petrie. So he was really interesting. Glenn Petrie. He was, uh, I believe he's a filmmaker also and is, uh, you know, an actual yep. Cajun guy. Grew up in uh, in South Louisiana and told us about basically what we needed to know about the Rougarou, as well as uh, mentioned a lot of other cool stories about the, the Fufule, uh, the Sirens, which are you know like the mermaids, all kinds of really cool stuff. Even I forget what the, the term was in French, but it was like the Wild Man of the Woods, which he said was like your big fun yeah. story, which I think is yeah. new. And uh, I just thought it was a really cool interview. Uh, it wasn't like some of the other ones where we had a bunch of interviews. That was like the one main interview. And that's kind of how we learned a little bit. I learned stuff I didn't know about. You know, he, he talked about a lot Absolutely. of the stuff that has happened in that area. We won't give too much away. Obviously, you say that for the episode. But um, after that, yeah, we had- he, uh, he definitely talked a lot more about stuff than I thought he was going to talk about, which was awesome. Cause it really helped with the fact that that was our like only an interview that we ended up getting. Yeah. And it was just so interesting just hearing a lot about that Cajun folklore, how rich it was and how many stories there are. And uh, I, I really like appreciated that. And that was one of my favorite aspects of that whole interview. Um, I don't know. What did Eli and Jack think of the interview? Uh, that guy is an unbelievable storyteller. I mean, you just, you get absolutely immersed listening to him speak and I can, you know, the way he described it, you could totally imagine being a little Cajun kid hearing about the Rougarou and, you know, being even more terrified to go out into the swamp. Um, he gave us a lot of good information about, you know, some of more of the paranormal and, uh, folklore aspects of the Rougarou. I think we all learned a lot from that and it was, uh, a, a great thing to start the, the shoot with to you know take into the rest of it absolutely 
Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll be honest. I was very tired after we got off to the plane. After we got off the plane. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, haven't recovered yet. I know. I'm, I'm pretty tired. But uh, as Jack said, he was a really good storyteller, and he's got a really good voice. And it, you know, I just kind of plopped down, set up my little tripod wide shot, and then as he started speaking, I started kind of drifting away. So, so uh, I was a little bit in and out, but I did have a little conversation with him after afterwards and kind of asked him if he thought, you know, what he believed about the Rougarou and seemed like he believed that it's probably real. Yeah. So. Yeah, it was, I mean, one of my favorite parts of the interview with him was aside from hearing about all these swamp stories was talking to him afterwards because I wanted to ask him about the Cajun culture. Obviously it's a pretty unique culture. They, they're these sort of French people that were transplanted from the area, which is now modern day Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Canada this frozen, you know, uh, very cold coastal area to a hot and humid swamp environment with everything trying to kill you. A couple hundred years ago, the Cajun people came there when it was part of France before it was the U.S. And I wanted to ask him about kind of how that culture is. It's still hanging on. I know in the 1920s and 30s, they put in a lot of legislation that was banning the use of the French language. And he said, you know, you're looking at the last generation of, of Cajun French speakers, which I thought was kind of sad. So in a way, doing that interview, we preserved a little bit of that folklore, that culture that he transmits just as a person who grew up around that, which I thought was really cool. It's also really interesting. I asked him, you know, how, how similarly linguistically are you to France, uh, to French that's speaking of spoken in France, as well as uh, in Quebec in Canada, obviously that's a very large French speaking territory. He said, he told me a story. He said he had a film festival he was showing a Cajun French film entirely in Louisiana French up in Quebec in Montreal. And he said that all the movies, he didn't understand almost any of it. It was all either in a proper French or Canadian French. And he said there was one movie they played and he understood everything. And afterwards he went up and asked them, Hey, where was that one from? He said, Oh, that's from the Acadians there in uh, New Brunswick area. And it's a And he's like, wow, that was the only one I really understood, which is, as I mentioned, Acadians, you know, are what, a Cajun is a bastardized version of the word Acadian. So you can see how even a couple hundred years apart, those two dialects of French are still pretty similar. So that was really neat to just talk to him about that. Right. Yeah. I think, I, sorry, I'm just going to say this, but um, I think one of the things, at least for me personally, about looking into cryptids and things like that is finding out about the cultures and the people surrounding that cryptid. For me, that's a lot of fun. I mean, I'm a history guy. I like learning about different historical things. So this, I mean, I just like learning about people in general. So to me, it's just interesting uh, to do that and know the way people think sometimes because it can be very different, you know. Totally. Uh, regions and the way people grew up can completely shape the way they view the world. And a lot of times you'll come up with you know, ways of looking at the world that you've never even thought of before, you know, just because they grew up with gators in the backyard or something, you know? Right, right. So, I yeah, I feel like, makes sense. <laughs> I feel like that of the four that we've done this, or we did this season, the Ruger was probably the most, like, the one that was probably the most, like, culturally, like, specific hmm. out of all of them. Right. Which I think that, uh, I and I probably I don't know if I can I probably can speak for the whole crew, but you know they probably think that probably made us enjoy learning about it that much more because we weren't just learning about like a specific region and and the scripted we were learning about the culture itself that it kind of came from. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Totally. I mean, I think like when you look at something like the Mogollon monster, I feel like a lot of that is rooted in the kind of the cowboy kind of guys mm -hmm. out there in the West, uh, Lake Champlain, obviously fishermen. But, you know, it's kind of like a it's sure it's got its regional identity, um, but the Cajun culture, Louisiana is just such a unique melting pot of all these different types of cultures that I think it really, like you said, it made it unique and made learning about it just that much more interesting. I mean, I went into it knowing the base base knowledge about it, but basic stuff, but really not that much. So just just 
uh, you know, the interview alone with Glenn was amazing. And then obviously spending time with the Cajun man, our captain, Billy Gaston, was, was awesome. And we'll, we'll get into that, too. Um, but I did just want to read a couple quick comments here. Sharing Guy says, I live about 45 minutes from New Orleans. Very cool. We also had um, uh, one of our first questions we'll take from my buddy Stefan says, question for Eli and Nash. Do you guys have cool cryptid adventure hats like Alex? Well, I mean, I think Nash's picture there. Kind of you, you can, I don't know if you can, if you can see in, uh, yeah, if you can see in Jack's picture of me, that's my hat. <laughs> and I do. I do. I would yeah. go grab it right now, but I would have to disconnect. It's too much work. <laughs> I also have one, but mine is from Walmart, so it's a little less impressive. No, yours is the coolest one of all. Oh, thanks. I guess it is from Arizona Walmart. Yeah, so. there you go. There you go. That's a kind different. of we start, we start we started a thing to make sure we have the adventure hats, you know. And in Arizona, we all obviously had the cowboy hat look going because it fit, but we've continued it. Obviously, when you're in the South, wearing a cowboy hat is the thing to do. South or the West, but we did it in Vermont too. So it's definitely uh, definitely part of the look, I think. And yeah, you got to have a good encrypted hunting adventure hat. That's for sure. But anyway, um, oh, actually, this is the other comment I want to read from uh, BPD 1976 says, I'm from southern Louisiana. I have heard one while night fishing. Wow. That, that's pretty creepy. It's kind of like what uh, our captain there, Billy, was telling us. If you want to send me an email. Uh, BPD, go for it. I think that would be awesome to to hear a little bit more about that. But back to kind of like the breakdown. So Friday night, we obviously spent some time, or I keep mixing my day up. Thursday night, we spent some time in the French Quarter, Louisiana, Bourbon Street. We tried hand grenades, uh, all that sort of stuff. I want to talk a little bit about that. I know uh, Jack stayed out a little later than the three of us here. But um you guys try to have a bunch of scams pulled on you. For those that don't know, New Orleans, there's a lot of scammers. There's the classic one. If you're go, if you're planning on going, whenever you know you can, there's the classic scam of, oh, hey, I, I bet, I bet, I can tell you where you got your shoes, and then you tell them, and they say, okay, now you owe me a dollar. Uh, the kind of thing, you know, it's they pull a scam and they tried to pull it on Nash and Eli as they were walking. And I went up to the guy, I said, we're not playing that game, and he was, he stormed off saying, it's always one bad apple that has to ruin the bunch. <laughs> <laughs> and then Brian, uh, Brian, who's been on uh, the recap once for Milky and Monster, he actually got looped into getting his shoes shined and then uh, he didn't have any cash and they were requesting money from him. So we had to kind of do a rescue operation and get out of that area. <laughs> but, but there was a good amount of people out on the streets. I mean, I don't know. What did you guys think? Like yeah. having heard about Bourbon Street as this like party yeah. area, did it live up to it or what was it like? I, I was absolutely. So like yeah, you was- said, we. We stayed out a little later than you guys did. We kind of got a little wild, the crew. Um, but it was unbelievable how even on a Thursday night, uh, like, you know, in the middle of COVID, yeah. you still just have, you know, so much activity and so much life out there. It was awesome. I love that place. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely lived up to about what I expected it to be. Like you always see like the pictures of the French Quarter um, online and on TV and it was about what you would expect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It, it, I will say it it was awesome, but like that hand grenade was kind of a rip off. I'm not going to lie. Oh, the strongest drink in New Orleans. (laughs) I don't know if my tolerance is just really high, but I got, we got these $10 hand grenade drinks that you come in this obnoxious plastic, uh, kind of grenade shaped, uh, jug or whatever you want to call it glass and uh and I drank it and I just didn't really feel anything. I don't, I, again, I don't know if my tolerance is just too high, but it was, uh, it was definitely uh, could have been a little stronger, but no, it was a great time. It was we let off some steam. We, uh, Eli and I went for like seconds, but we all went to get beignets at oh, yeah. Cafe Du Monde, uh, which which yeah. are freaking awesome. I have a little thing here actually. Oh yeah, you got the. Uh, I you got, got you got the mix. I got my bag there from Cafe Du Monde. He's gonna make Bigfoot shaped beignets. Yeah, and. Uh, oh. He's gonna be selling them through Amazon. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna start up a beignet thing up here. But oh yeah, it was it was awesome. We went for seconds. It was just a fun night. Got to let off some steam before we really started. Uh, kind of some of the the groundwork we did. Then on Friday we um, headed out to as Nash mentioned the Jean Lafitte uh, National Park Preserve Forest area. 
uh, initial impressions, guys, from each of you about what it's like being in a true swamp like that. Like, what were your first thoughts? I know some of you guys have never been in Louisiana in that area before. So what was like your first start? Let's just start with uh, with Nash and then go down the line. Yeah, it was crazy. Uh, it was it was funny how how much warmer it got inside the swamp itself once we were out of the wind and everything was kind of insulating. Uh yeah, not much, uh, not much uh, solid ground out there. We pretty much were walking on these, you know, wood, wood planks to get into it, and uh, it was definitely cool, though. A lot of, a lot of big, big spiders that we saw. We didn't see any get, uh, we didn't see alligators out there during the day. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was really cool. It was, it was definitely, uh, it was definitely a cool experience and a lot of fun walking around through there and just getting to explore it. Definitely. Jack? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just think it's it's wild how much life can be in such a small area and how they went through and made these planks so you can actually walk in the swamp because on one side it's water and the other side it's water and you have just this little narrow thing to, you know, not be down in it. And I think the thing that freaked me out the most was how often you see spiders the size of your hand, like just right at head head face level because you you see one of those and you think like wow that's like wild you know you never see that but then when you go on this trail you're dodging like six or seven by the time you get done it's a very hostile environment totally yeah i mean i think i was really surprised just by how little actual land there was um i think as a as a waitress told us and what I discovered to be true is like sometimes you'll look at something and think it's land, but then it's just, it's not. It's just a little bit of dirt like circled up, clumped up together in the water. And you're just like, goodness gracious. Like I could only imagine just trying to get through that territory. You know, I, I made the joke, you know, the same thing about Phoenix and Arizona. It's like, who just came in here and was like oh yes this looks like a great place to start a city it was just like it doesn't yeah. make sense <laughs> like <laughs> no yeah that's that's funny it's like you go from that swamp and and yeah it what, what was the thing they were saying about you have the it looks like solid ground but it's actually just marshy floating peat or something like that i don't know if that's yeah. what the comment is and sharon guy saying piton it is or something like that yeah, it was. It's just surprising. I mean, I love those swamp areas. It's just I, I don't think there's anything like it. Obviously, Eli and I talking about that too. How we come from areas where there's mountains and there's a lot of hills, and we're always kind of used to seeing a mountain. Whereas you guys from the Midwest, you're kind of used to seeing it flat. But it's crazy. You see, just you, you get to these outlooks and you just see for miles just grasslands and plains uh, because it goes from the marsh, or rather, there's like the swamp. There's the marsh, the delta, and the delta and the bayou, and they're all kind of interconnected different layers and it's all like one ecosystem that's alive with so much life not just things like gators but tons of birds nutria which i guess are invasive uh, lots of don't do not underestimate don't, don't, the don't, size. Don't, play them, yeah. <laughs> don't downplay the nutria, nutria. Yeah. just wanted to read a quick couple comments here but chris jarvis says new orleans love that place one of the paranormal capitals of the world been there several times yeah, it is a lot of weird. I mean, uh, it's obviously, the Ruguru stories kind of in the swamps around the city, but tons of ghost stories, lots of uh, vampire stories, all sorts of stuff in New Orleans. Sharing guys says it's a party there 24 7. Seems that way even during during COVID. BPD says should have gone to Vachery. I'm probably butchering that. And then Chris also says Sazerac is a good drink there. Yeah, we all, we all tried the now most. Now you tour- tell us. Yeah, we tried the most touristy thing we possibly could. Hey, to be fair, though, you guys left before we hit some of the other bars and like rum and cokes there were like 12 bucks. So oh, wow. I think hand grenade is actually like the best deal you can get. Oh, no kidding. I don't know. Maybe that is that COVID pricing, but it might be <laughs> Drake C says I live in, in Lafitte and I think uh, BPT said John Lafitte phonetically. That's how you pronounce it. Yeah, thanks for that um alex wait where did this go i will email you alex is your address on here yeah if you go to my um if you click on the channel and go to the about section there's my email should be on there so please feel free to send me an email there oh and somebody already shared my other email you could email me at this one too if you'd like to share that story on there 
Um, Sharon Guy also says New Orleans is below sea level. Yeah, and it was crazy seeing the uh, the levees. We drove by the levees at one point. I think you just you you, you realize you're been below the sea level, so it's just kind of kind of strange. Well, I, I don't know what Eli finds so funny here. Nothing. I'll explain <laughs> after the show. Somebody may have. I don't know if there's something. Uh, I'm missing something here, but yeah, my internet is like freaking out right now. Um. Anyway, all right. Back on track. We'll talk a little bit about uh, our day out on the swamp with Cajun Man because I know there's a couple stories we want to tell, and then we'll get into some questions from the audience, questions and comments. So let's talk a little bit about. You know, we spent obviously we we just talked about Thursday and then Friday. Saturday, that was also a big production day because as Nash mentioned, we sort of had to divvy up our time between doing a little nature walk in Homa. We went to Homa, Louisiana, which is about an hour uh, southwest of uh, New Orleans. And that's kind of the where there was the Rougarou Festival. Uh, originally, that's what we were. That's why we chose that time slot is we wanted to go to the Rougarou Festival and talk to those folks. They have an awesome, you know, Halloween kind of perfect timing event. But given that it's COVID, that didn't really happen. But Homa is a place that I visited in the past. Used to have a friend who uh, was stationed down there in the Coast Guard, awesome place. And we went on an awesome boat tour. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the nature walk and then uh, the boat tour. So we went to a place called the Mandalay Wildlife Refuge and we ate loquats, which are swamp lemons, basically. Yeah, <laughs> those are good. Oh yeah, those are yeah. good though. Uh, we thought they were like oranges or exactly. lemons or something and we rip them open and I don't know. We all experienced a new fruit, I guess. Yeah, that was interesting. It just I saw these fruits laying on the ground like lemons, and I thought somebody had just thrown them in there. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, people, typical. But then I look up, and it's this tree, and it has these things, and we cut them up, and we kind of inspected them first and saw that they clearly weren't um, – you know, they were something lemon-like or orange-like. It was like we cut it up and started eating it. I would say it's like a mix between a lemon and an orange. It looks like a lemon tastes a little bit like a, an orange. Weird. Yeah. It was good, though. It was a good, that was a fun discovery. And then we learned that they are called loquats, which I believe are indigenous to parts of Asia. But um, for some reason, it was there. Probably just somebody had planted it there. I don't know. It was a big tree. Yeah, it's, like the, it's like the only, it's like the only one there. Yeah. So maybe somebody planted that like uh, 30, 40 years ago. I don't know. Weird. That's pretty sick, though, when you think about it. It's just been there for a while. But what did you guys think of that area as compared to uh, Jean Lafitte? It was it was definitely smaller, but it was a lot more solid ground. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, really you know, the, I think that one would have made a good investigation just because we could have gotten a little deeper. Like we said before, um, we were pretty much tied to the boardwalks uh, at the place we ended up working at, the Jean Lafayette or whatever. Um but you know, it was, it's just, it's beautiful. It's, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Eli. Oh say, yeah. Say your, I mean, piece. Whoa, whoa. All right, dude. Uh, I thought it was nice. I thought it was a nice little walk. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if I would have liked the idea of being out there at night. I, I felt because there was so much, dry ground i don't know I, I would be a little scared of gators or something like that which i guess there was an issue with gators later but <laughs> yeah and, and we'll get to that yeah, a little absolutely. bit definitely <laughs> definitely a big part of it but uh after that we went to uh, a tour awesome tour if you guys are in the area and you want to get a feel for the bayou down there in south louisiana hit up billy guston he has a uh tour service called a cajun man swamp tours uh re really awesome guy he took us out there in the swamp and did some kind of the rougarou tour and he told us a little bit about what he had experienced and his family and and also just like glenn who we had interviewed he grew up in that area he like grew up right on the bayou uh, hunting and fishing that area and showing us where he'd been camping in areas that i'm like i don't know if i would camp here with all these gators just kind of surrounding the area but what did you guys think about being in that area and seeing him feed gators and all that kind of stuff oh it was uh, awesome it was, yeah. it was so much fun guy was pretty hardcore i mean you could tell that guy has spent the majority of his life out there in the swamp 
he was just so at home with it, you know, and just kind of knew the different alleys and canals, if you will, uh, through the through the bayou. So, yeah, anyone who can spot and uh, you know call a gator by name, you get you know they're authentic. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, he would call them like they were dogs and they would come out and, uh, you know, he'd just feed them like a chicken wing on a on a stick, basically. And yeah, and, and yeah so it was it was amazing. We got to see the sunset. We had quite some drone incidents. We'll put it that way. Yeah. Do not fly yeah. drones oh, man. Man. out in that area. I thought that I was going to say goodbye to my drone. So, um, you know, obviously on these kind of productions, we film a lot of aerial stuff. We. Uh, myself and Sammy, another crew member, we decided to get our drones out. You know, you had when we were on the boat and it was kind of surrounded by it had a roof, so there was only like metal openings, like railings, and you had to turn obstacle avoidance off. Man, I had to turn that off to get out of the boat and I didn't turn it back on in time. And uh, we've been flying for about 20 minutes, then I was backing up and uh, I just see that I clip a tree, and the cypress trees I should mention are some of the largest trees in the world. They're related to redwood and sequoia trees. So they're in the same family group. They can be like hundred feet tall. Um, these ones are probably 70, 80 feet. And I clipped the top of one and I just see my drone go spiraling and I, my like heart sank and, and I, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to tell you guys, I'm like, my drone's gone. It's, it's gone. And everyone's like, wait, what do you mean? Like, are you being serious? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's gone. So, yeah, that- that was pretty nuts. And I remember because, you know, I have a another drone as if we don't have enough drones with us when we go out. But uh, you and Sammy took it out. I didn't want to take it out because I didn't want to turn object avoidance off. Smart man. And you guys were out there getting these crazy sick shots. And I was like, oh, man, maybe I should have, you know, taken it out there. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so my drone crashed and this is, I still think this is a miracle of some kind. I do not know how this happened. Um, basically it crashed and it didn't appear to hit the water or fall into the water. And I could still see it on the map and the camera was active. So I'm like, Oh my God. And we start looking and we can see the red light of the drone as it's on the ground level. Miraculously, it somehow landed on a patch of land that wasn't you know, the water, it's, we're talking about a bayou where it's probably 90% water. I mean, there's very small patches of land. It happens to land there and within distance that we can actually get the boat kind of relatively up to it. So we backed the boat into that area and Nash decided to hop out and, uh, and, and rescue my drone there. We put a plank of wood out. He retrieved it even more miraculous than the fact that it didn't fall in the water, landed on the dry ground. There was no major damage to the drone aside from one rotor, which is easily replaceable, being broken. Drone itself was fine. I've done a check on it. It seems to be okay. I'm going to try it out on a shorter flight soon. But, I mean, I I probably was like the luckiest guy in Louisiana that day for sure. <laughs> Unreal. Yeah, and then, of course, crazy friends. <laughs> yeah, and thank you, Nash, obviously. And the footage, Eli sent me the GoPro footage of it. it looks awesome, Nash jumping out. And he didn't go that far in because – uh, just thinking about how if it had landed 10 or 15 feet behind that location, we wouldn't have been able to get to it and it would have been in the water. So it's just like the series of circumstances that played right into our favor. So uh, it was amazing. But then when Sammy was bringing his drone in, he also had the obstacle. Yeah. Off, and I was trying to grab it and it ended up flipping over and falling into the boat. It's OK, but we didn't have much drone luck that day. Mm. <laughs> But it was other than that, it was an amazing time on the boat and we got to see the sunset on the bayou, which I think was something really special. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That goes right up there, I think, with the uh the stars out there over the lake. As one some of my favorite memories from season one. That was some pretty crazy stuff. Oh, it's Champlain, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's just been so much uh so much like awesome awesome events like that that has happened on the show and uh and I guess let's talk now about the night investigation without giving too much away, but let's say a little bit about that because that was interesting, <laughs> to say the least. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we were going to go to the uh, – we decided we wanted to do the investigation at the uh, the park in Homa because it you know, it was a little bit smaller than the, the, uh, the Jean Lafitte. 
but it had a little bit more land that we could, you know, get off of the path with. Well, we get there about, what would you say, about nine or so at night and already dark and we pull in and we're getting ready to leave. And all of a sudden in like the property nearby, all we start hearing is just like gunshots and this and that going off. And whoever, you know, lived in this property was just, you know, having, you know, having, having some late night gun fun. Yeah. So we're like, okay, you know, obviously we're not worried about catching a bullet, but you know, whatever, whatever was alive out here that we might be looking for is obviously scared off by now because of all the gunshots and it's just going to be an audio nightmare. Yeah. So we're like, all right, well, you know, Jean Lafitte's, you know, hour and a half or so away, you know, we, let's just, you know, that's our other option. Let's just do it. So, you know, we ended up driving, you know, the hour and a half from Homa to John Lafette to do our night investigation. So probably the latest we've ever started a night investigation. I think we pulled in probably 1130 ish, a little after that, uh, got all of our stuff unpacked, hiked in, you know, we set up trail cameras and ended up splitting up into, uh, there's seven of us. So we split up into, you know, a group of four and a group of three, mm. Uh, the group of four, which I was part of, went all the way to the very end of the the, the boardwalk. While uh, Alex and Eli and our other cameraman Brian stayed kind of in the middle a little bit, and we, yeah, it was it was very very scary out there at night. Uh, aside from the uh, the incidents that transpired later on in the evening, where we, yeah, uh, Jack and I and Mikhail and our cameraman Sammy kind of came around this corner and shined our lights over the bayou and you could just see all the alligator eye shine just staring at us. And we, you know, we're we kind of just ignored it. We're like, okay, whatever, you know, we're not bothering them. They're kind of farther away. Well, so we kind of did some stuff for the investigation while we were kind of on our way back and they were closer. They were kind of, they were closer to the, you know, the boardwalk area. We're like, okay, let's just kind of tread lightly. Well, all of a sudden they just start, freaking out and there's loud splashing and you know this and that and, and uh uh Mikhail and sammy got really freaked out you know jack took off and it yeah that was pretty you know, uh pretty tense pretty tense was, uh scary moment it definitely was i mean we were uh e eli myself and brian were in another location and we had uh you know four walkie talkies between the two groups and um, you know, we're radioing back and forth like, hey, what's going on? We were doing 10 minute checks. So every 10 minutes we would check on each other. And you guys started talking about the alligators and you know, we were having nothing in our area. We would hear slight movement, that kind of thing, but nothing much. Uh, and uh, we started to kind of we decided we were going to start to meet up. And then we obviously met up with you guys. And there was uh, quite a bit of fear, to say the least, of, uh, of what was happening. I mean, Jack, what did you think about you know being in that situation? Oh, I mean, you know, we'd been watching these things for something like 15, 20 minutes at this point, just kind of, you know, doing our investigation stuff. You know, they're watching us. We're watching them. It's it's obvious, but they didn't seem too intimidated. But uh, yeah, on that way back, I don't know if we just stood in the wrong spot for too long or what, but one of them was very not happy for us to to be there. And uh, it got very real very quick. I'll say that we, we were kind of <laughs> having fun and making fun of the gators and you know, not really respecting the swamp and what's in it. And then suddenly, suddenly it didn't want us there. So, you know, you perk up pretty quick and we, we got out of there very fast. Yeah. And, and I'm we, sure that's going to be amazing audio to listen to all of us, you know, curse and scream and run away. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and we just wanted to make sure nobody, you know, was uh, panicking too much and that order didn't break down obviously. And, you know, I, I made my way over there. Obviously we all had, some sort of defensive weapons, but, um, you know, we just didn't, didn't want to be in that situation. So we decided it would be smarter to start backing out of that area slowly. And we did, and we did that as a group as, as calmly as we could and, uh, and kind of took it from there, but yeah, everything else you will see in the episode, you know, what we did on the night investigation and that sort of stuff, because it was definitely, I'd say eventful. I think, would you guys say that was, uh, the, the most scary environment so far? Because I mean, the only other one I would really compare it to would be, in the Mogollon Rim in Arizona, where you do have the threat of large mountain lions as well as a uh, bear pretty frequently, but mostly mountain lions and rattlesnakes, of course. I mean, didn't we see a wolf? In we did the see a wolf. Rim? Yeah, we did see a wolf cross the road. Yeah, it ran right in front of our car. Yeah, 
Yeah, I would say, yeah, out of I think of, out of everywhere I've gone in this show over the years, and especially with these the, the season one, it was probably the most densely, uh, uh, most dense uh, environment and probably the most scariest environment in terms of things that can actually kill you outside of what we're looking for that we've ever been to. Um, yeah, it definitely added an interesting element. Yeah. What do you think, Jack and Eli? Oh, I mean, I yeah, big time. I've only been on the project since Arizona. But, um, you know, I for me, the only thing that comes close is being out in rickety kayaks in the middle of Lake Vermont. But that one, I still felt yeah, a little Lake in control. Vermont. Yeah. Oh, whoops. Yep. Uh, <laughs> that was the joke we kept making. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, absolutely. I mean, as soon as you step into that swamp at night, like it just, it seems like an alien world. And, you know, I don't think my eyes ever stopped darting from, you know, right in front of my feet to up ahead. You know, you're just constantly scanning and it's terrifying. That place sucks. <laughs> it's cool. Well, but and then too, it sucks you know, I, was, I was always at the pack of, uh, you know, the front of our pack and the amount of spider webs that I probably cleared out of the way for everybody that I just, you know, I was always constantly brushing my face cause they were just like everywhere. And yeah, I was, that was probably the, the closest to it literally felt, I, I felt like Arnold and predator. Like it was just, there was something going to be everywhere yeah. and I was using the trees. Yeah. Eli. Yeah. I, I mean, kind of like what Jack was saying, you know, it's just a totally foreign environment. Uh, you know, I grew up in Southern California. We don't have anything remotely similar to what we are in. You know, the birds sound different. The bugs are different. You know, surprisingly huge. Um, and the mosquitoes will eat you alive through your genes. So... <laughs> Uh, I have so many bug bites on my legs that I have discovered this morning. It's like not even funny. Uh, and I'm just like, why? Bug spray didn't do anything. No, it did nothing. And I don't, the trees are different. The water's different. There's obviously alligators, you know, nutria, all sorts of things <laughs> that I, I've never been exposed to until before this trip. You know, I think if we do another episode in a similar region, I will be, it's a fly. It's not a mosquito. It's a fly. Okay. I freaked myself <laughs> out. I was like, I brought them back with me, <laughs> but I think next time I'll be a little more prepared for this type of environment. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's same. such a unique environment. I, I thought it was really awesome to be out there and, they, when they say the swamp is alive, it really, <laughs> truly is. I mean, obviously, Mogollon Rim, it was sort of a kind of forested area, much more similar to what I, I some of us are used to, especially myself. You know, you're dealing with uh, larger animals um, that aren't really, you know, in lurking in the swamp or lurking in the water. Uh, Lake Champlain was an aquatic environment, so it's totally different. There's nothing really that I'm scared of that would try to eat me in the water in Lake Champlain. Champ is not known to be carnivorous for the most part, or at least to humans. Uh, the Bridgewater yeah, Triangle, the, the, the scariest thing in the Bridgewater Triangle, the Freetown State Forest, was the threat of people. You know, there's all these satanic cults and that kind of stuff. So it was definitely the most, uh, I'd say, the biggest threat presented from natural sources in the swamps. But I, I loved every minute of being out there, and I can't wait to go back. And um, it's just such a, like we mentioned, such a different environment. I think that kind of answer. Oh, Eli. Yeah, go ahead. I think you mean when we go into a similar environment, not if we it, go back to. A I didn't. I didn't want to give anything away, my friend, dude. So we're not giving anything away, but we're going to end up in sketchy environments like that eventually. Again. That, that's true. But I guess that kind of be worse gives things. You, that answers Carrick's question, which was, "What is a night investigation like in such a predator-ridden area?" Definitely disconcerting. Like the movie Predator. <laughs> yeah, very disconcerting. Uh, tactical Bigfoot Research, that's that's my buddy Mike. Awesome guy. He says, hi, guys. Photos of your trip looked awesome. Yeah, I got to say, it was it was absolutely awesome. It was a lot of fun to be out there. So, yeah, let's take a couple questions now and some comments, and uh, we can talk yeah, a little bit about Yeah, definitely some good ones I've been seeing. 
Yeah, for sure. So Stefan asks, when investigating a cryptid, how often do you look into its origins? Some stories of the Ruguru date back to the 16th century. Does a long history add or subtract from the validity of its existence? Thanks, Stefan, as always. It uh, it definitely depends. It depends on the cryptid. I mean, everyone, we always look, look as far back as we can. But in terms of a longer, or shorter history, it kind of depends on the cryptid at hand, I guess. At least for me. Sure. Jack? I've, oh, go ahead. I'll just uh, kind of go down the line of the where the screens are. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, for uh, again, kind of newer to the project and uh, kind of newer to cryptids too. Um, I think when you do have, specifically this one kind of was, it drove it home the most for me is when you have just like these stories that are so consistent and passed down for so long um, you know, you definitely have to stop and think, you know, why, why is it staying the way it is? And why does this continue to get passed down like this? You know, when, when we did Arizona, a lot of the kind of like the Bigfoot Mogi and monster stuff, we heard a lot of it was different and a lot, you'd hear a lot of different things from different people. Um, but when you get something like this, where most everyone we talked to was very consistent and, you know, dates back so long, I think that definitely gives a little more validity to something like that. Yeah. Eli? Yeah, I think uh, I think it does give it a little bit of uh, validity. Um, uh, to me, I'm kind of skeptical of, you know, certain cryptids that kind of just pop up. Uh, and sometimes things with long histories don't really have a long history. I mean, like the Chupacabra, you could argue, uh, some do argue that it didn't come into existence until 1995. So whether that's just a semantics thing or if it physically came into existence in 95 is a, is a debate, which I don't understand why. Uh, anyways, but so I think, you know, Rougarou sightings, especially when you look at it as passed down, it's almost a, 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 a twisted version of the word loop guru, which comes from yeah. the French, you know, uh, and that just dating all the way back to even germanic folklore i think adds a validity to it uh or who knows maybe it's just an old wives tale that's just been passed down through generations and different cultures yeah i, I would definitely agree with a, a lot of what you guys said and especially Eli, what you said about you know the cultural obviously the cajun french culture it's a unique culture but i think just differing to some of the other cryptids we've investigated on this season this just seems much more of a um sort of a paranormal rather than a physical being as with the Pukwaji, I think, you know, champ is probably more on the physical side. The Mogian monster is a Bigfoot like creature. So probably more on the physical side, whereas this seems to be, there's a lot of really interesting folklore, like the, the, the relations to Catholicism and Christianity, you know, the, uh, the using of the 13 objects, because apparently the Ruguru can't, count past 11 so you throw 13 things and it has oh. to stop and count so it, it's a really interesting <laughs> kind of um tale and i just do want to say i did get a a message sent to me by uh the username blue daxi who is in the comments saying the only crypt that i've seen to date was a ruguru type creature in oklahoma both i and that and another person saw it from separate vehicles so thanks for sharing i, I will um you know talk to him about that a little more uh, Raptor Crazy says, question, does the Ruguru have footprints like a wolf or more like a Bigfoot? I've never heard of this. It's a good question. I would say more like a wolf, probably. Yeah. I mean, if, especially if it's supposed to be kind of a large wolf, but we don't know. <laughs> Wait, I mean, we also heard accounts of it around. taking a bunch of different shapes. So uh, who knows? Yeah. It's very, um, it's very uh, like Skinwalker-esque in a yeah. way, kind of. Yeah, and I think that's what's kind of interesting that, you know, it does have that wolf-like, dogman-like description, but then there is, as we mentioned, the, the sort of uh, shift in there. Oh, let's see. Uh, all right. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we we got to put that comment in there. That is great. Uh, Carrick, Carrick, obviously, with the zinger here that's making us all laugh. The Ruguru being unable to count past 11 isn't supernatural. It's a failure on the part of our Ruguru education system. <laughs> that is just awesome. Oh, that's great. So, yeah, obviously, Carrick there with the, uh, with the comic relief and 
I think we got another pretty strong comment here. Chupacabra is real. <laughs> EJW workshop. So, hey. Maybe. Uh, we, we don't want to contest <laughs> Stay <that>. tuned. <laughs> I think that was in response to Chris Jarvis who said, don't believe in, in the chupa. <laughs> uh, I mean, a fight. A fight to ruin, it's, dude. It's, it's getting bad. <laughs> But um, just a couple other comments here. Let's see. Dixie Q says, if you ever watched the show Cajun Justice, in one of the episodes, a guy supposedly filmed one on his phone camera. Oh, that's interesting. We'll yeah. Uh, I mentioned that in the Cryptid Campfire episode. Oh, cool. I couldn't find the episode. Did it look, did it look like that? <laughs> no. Yeah, we, we, we've got some pretty cryptic evidence that we took. Uh, we'll call it evidence. I think Carrick made a snide comment in regards to our video earlier but chris says uh those swamp skeeters drink deet like kool-aid oh we learned that the hard way like for it. sure they don't they're not really faced by it at all <laughs> oh man so uh bpd says nothing to fear from alligators unless you are close to the nest so i mean hopefully we were not able to <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jack said, the jack kept saying yeah uh, yep no we were told that and uh on the way to the spot that we had our little encounter we passed some uh younger crocodile or alligators and uh thought nothing of it until things went down so we we didn't learn until it was too late yeah and, and we, we were following a trail we weren't like just going off the trail in this instance so unless that nest was next to the trail that was that would have been obviously unfortunate drake c says it's what you oh where'd the comment go here it is it's what you don't see is what gets you in trouble in the swamp i don't know Absolutely. i mean that's... <laughs> yeah probably cottonmouth snake that was probably the most concerned uh, or something i was the most concerned about because that's one yeah. of the most venomous snakes in north america i believe so so yeah that um you know i'm glad we did we did encounter that but yeah overall i mean it was just such an interesting time i mean would you guys go back to louisiana back to the swamp i know i certainly would oh i would oh, I, oh yeah oh yeah yeah in a so, heartbeat the food. i wouldn't i wouldn't go at night but i would definitely go back <laughs> uh no i think i was opening up my southern roots a little bit by eating frog legs and jambalaya and i was just i just loved fell in love with everything i was putting in my mouth down there wow that sounds <laughs> <laughs> yeah no clip that clip that yeah it's, it's, a, it's a lot of sausage i liked everything that i was eating down there there <laughs> yeah so yeah we had alligator sausage we had po' boys i mean shrimp po' boys chicken po' boys boudin everything you can imagine all the good stuff uh, beignets, as I said, we gorge ourselves pretty frequently on those. I know I certainly did. Even at the airport yesterday, I got like two bags of fresh beignets to go and I ate like two of them and basically made a mess on the carpet of the airport that looked like somebody was just snorting a mountain of cocaine. Uh, there's, there's no there's no way to eat those without making a mess. And as a bearded guy, I, I like and I had to put my mask back on. I'm like, God, there's sugar all over my beard. I had to go and like with the mask and wash my face after. It's crazy. But did you did you see the floor of uh, the cafe in New <laughs> no. Orleans? You could yeah, have gone sledding yeah, in there. I know. Yeah. You could have gone sledding in there. It was crazy. Like in Pablo Escobar's back room. Like, oh my god, <laughs> it was crazy. There was a comment I wanted to read. Uh, let's see if I can find that. Oh yeah, Juanita says. Can't wait to can't wait to see this. Yeah, we're really excited to show everybody about, um, you know, what the show is about and some of these really awesome adventures we've had the awesome luck of being able to go on even during this kind of crazy year. Thank you, Deanna Cusimano. Awesome, appreciate that super chat. Uh, let's see here. I, this is like my internet is just going nuts right now. Oh, yeah. We'll take another one from Carrick. So Carrick says, Alexander, when you filmed a bit for your Honey Island Swamp uh, episode on Out of the Shadows, do you think this environment and that one are very similar? Any key differences? Yeah, they're actually very similar. I mean, um, where we were was like south of New Orleans, whereas the Honey Island Swamp and Slidell, Louisiana is about an hour north of Louisiana, or of, of um, New Orleans, kind of towards the, the border with Mississippi. And that, that swamp is um, just basically right across Lake Pontchartrain. It's just right across from there. The only key difference I would say is that there's a, there's a lot of honeybees in the um, Honey Island Swamp. I guess they brought them over there 
when the French came and it was kind of known for that. That's why they call it the Honey Island Swamp. And there you have the Honey Island Swamp Monster, which is more of a Bigfoot-like, skunk ape-like cryptid. So I don't know, maybe there's a Ruger running around there and they kind of fight each other or, you know, they're both mistaken for each other. I don't know. But it's, yeah, pretty, pretty similar. Oh, they're definitely from mistaken for each other. I mean, look at Chow Chow. <laughs> yeah, there's been some, some controversy regarding the the Rougarou. Uh, Juanita just says maybe you're just a you're you just a messy eater. Uh, maybe he but is. He is very messy eater. Yeah. I have video of, of, of these guys eating and making a mess. Okay, so it, it's not easy to eat those beignets. I gotta say. Proof. We need proof. I don't see proof. There's a comment that's uh pretty funny in there about <laughs> Eli and sausages. I won't bring it up. <laughs> oh my. Carrick is apologizing. I'm so sorry to throw in so many comments here. Just came across some alleged Ruguru audio. I'm, I'll be sure to send it your way. Yeah, that would be awesome. Very cool. But okay. So, to me. Yeah, so we'll, um, we'll uh, check that out for sure. But this was obviously the last episode of... Um, the first season. So do we want to just take a little bit of time here? Uh, yeah, I, I know. I want to respond to Bill Murr's real quick. Uh, sure. Thank you. Uh, I've like, been... If you put your black hat and let your hair down, you could. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think I've yeah. thought about that before. Yeah, I can. Uh, uh, I've been told that before. So thank you. Well, at least you didn't get called a Bigfoot this episode. <laughs> But, this anyway, episode. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so let's just take a minute and talk about, uh, you know, our thoughts on this first season. Obviously, it started out in March. Nash and I and some of the other guys were on that puck wedge shoot and just initial impressions like, go ahead, Nash. <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, after, after a long deliberation, I don't know if we're just going to air any of these. I think they're just going to kind of sit, sit, on the hard, sit on the old hard drive for a while. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I mean... I think we went into Puck Wiggy with uh, a pretty good plan for the year, and um, I've kind of done this in the uh, in years prior where I've kind of gone into you know one case thinking, oh, this is going to be the the one that's going to start everything, and you know I'm going to do you know several consecutive episodes, and it's just never happened, and kind of had that same thought in the back of my mind, but I think we uh, ended up with a really uh, really solid crew to start it all off with. Uh, Definitely had the, some interesting bonding moments in that first Puckwidgee shoot uh, with our uh, Motel Six uh, incident, and always something um, happens on these shoots. Oh yeah, always. Um, yeah, and then uh, you know we obviously self-funded that first episode, and then you know we were pretty eager to kind of keep the ball rolling, so we all self-funded. You know, we all threw our own money back into the pot again to fund the uh, Ruguru episode. And that was kind of the Mo first one for Mogia Jack Monster. and Eli coming in. Oh, sorry, yeah, Mogia Monster. Uh, that was the first one for Jack and Eli. Eli originally coming into that one as kind of more of a guest, and then we all liked him, so we you know kept him around. Uh, and then we did our Kickstarter in May, and that kind of helped fund the remaining two, which was Champ and this uh, the last one, which is on the Rougarou. Um, really it all just, everything really fell into place really nicely. We, you know, have built, you know, built a lot more momentum for the show, a lot, of, a lot more people, uh, than there already was, uh, interested in seeing what we have to offer, especially with the, the group of people that we have assembled, obviously, uh, uh, Eli and Alex and myself all kind of have our own, uh, respected fan bases that are now kind of converging on for this this project. So it's been a lot of fun. It's uh, really happy with the crew. I'm really happy with everyone's hard work. And, uh, you know, we're all a group of very solid filmmakers and we all jump in and, you know, jump in where needed. And, you know, Jack countless times is, you know, running audio inter interviews as well as holding a camera and, um, or taking photos and running audio and, or, and filming at the same time as I've seen yeah. him do. Uh, yeah, it's 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 just come together in a way that I never thought was ever possible, and I'm very very happy to to show everybody what we what we found and what we experienced and what we went through. And uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot of hair pulling really looking forward these to... episodes together. But yeah. <laughs> it, it, it worked. Somehow. Yeah. Really, but... uh, really looking forward to the future, future after this. Definitely. Now, Jack, I want to hear from you because you are, as you mentioned, you came out of the project kind of at the same time Eli did, but you're not really a cryptid person as opposed to the three of us who have kind of been in this for a few years. What did you think about being on the search for cryptids compared to maybe other projects you've worked on in the past? And just what were your initial thoughts about the whole season? Um, yeah, I mean, I never in my wildest dreams imagined I'd be running through woods consistently searching for uh monsters but you know here we are and i really couldn't be happier um you know like nash said we have an amazing team and i think everyone everyone pulls their weight and understands what needs to be done um in terms of the cryptid stuff and how it relates to other stuff uh i mean like i said i i currently work for a church so you know i pay the bills by we're making videos for god and then uh at night, go hunt Bigfoots. Um, I, I, I would say nothing has exposed me to more new things than this world. You know, just the people you meet and the places you go. And I, I, I get the appeal, you know. I, I I wouldn't trade this for the world, and I'm sure you guys wouldn't either. Totally, totally. No, not at all. Mr. Um, Watson. I wouldn't, trade, I wouldn't trade you for the world either, Jack. Hey, Whoa. thanks, baby. Yeah. Jack put some great work in, and he he, he makes sure we sound good, even though even when we don't, and yep. we're you know stumbling around in the woods at night. Yeah, it's true. Um, you know, for me, thinking back like six months ago, I wouldn't have imagined myself uh, looking for the cryptids that I talk about on the show. You know, uh, I talk about how Cryptid Campfire really started as a kind of a release for this random interest I've had since I was little, just cryptids and stuff, and kind of gave it an avenue to uh, kind of justify it. And <laughs> I think uh, Chasing Legends more than anything has shown, you know, myself and uh, a lot of my family members that this is Bigfoot is more than just for, you know, cutesy clothing and whatnot. It's you can do some really cool stuff out of it. And so you know, driving to Arizona because I met you guys halfway through the shoot. Was, I mean, that was the first time, I guess, going on a trip to meet up with you guys. And it just was like pretty nuts, an all new environment to me. Luckily, I had friends in Arizona um, besides you guys. But I mean, it's just been a blast going all over the country and stuff with you guys and looking for these things. You know, I'm just excited to see where we go and all the places we'll visit and all the people we'll meet so yeah totally I, I, all the uh, all the all the uh, crazy crazy shenanigans we'll get in oh yeah so many good times yeah i mean i think back to just last winter when nash just hit me up saying hey i know you live in the new england area we're doing a thing on the puckwudgie uh you know do you know anybody who's uh you know interested in it or know stuff about it and i was like yeah sure I'll, i'd be glad to hook you up with some people and then you're like, oh, you want to uh, be an investigator with us for the show? I'm like, sure. And then somehow from there, ended up coming on the team. Uh, and then it wasn't until <laughs> many months later when we went to Arizona, obviously COVID happened in between that. And I just think about, as, as Eli and everyone else has mentioned, just the uh, sheer amount of cool environments and places we went, all the different people we met, things that we learned. I mean, I, I Champ, and something I've researched for a while and uh, didn't really know much about the, the Mogion monster. Didn't know a whole lot about the Rougarou. Uh, didn't even know all that much about the Puck Wedges. I learned some new stuff for sure. And it was just really interesting learning that and experiencing so many new things. And I'm really excited to see where this goes. And, and just becoming friends with all you guys, like really good friends. And, uh, you know, the things we've been yeah. through, it's it like Nash said, bonding experiences. That first time, you know, we'd met each other that day. And then we're already in this crazy situation in a crazy motel and Brockton, Massachusetts, you know, with like crackheads around and other insanity and just all the things that we've been into and you know, even the planning of the episodes because it takes weeks, if not months to plan some of these episodes and frustrations back and forth with dealing with people and dealing with uh, other circumstances you can't control and and just kind of amazes me how it all worked out in the end. And I just love that so much. Yeah. I think you guys Jesus are awesome. Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. What? What? Uh, What's going on? Sorry. Rube sorry, my, 
Yeah, Rug's in my window. Uh, oh, no, my, my cat jumped up on the back of my chair and started, like, fucking with my head. <laughs> oh, oh, man. man. <laughs> she's pissed. Oh, man, be careful. But she she's mad that we leave for, you know, three, four days at a time to, you know, she's come back smelling like Rugers and Bigfoots. <laughs> but, yeah, in closing, I mean, just it's been awesome, been a lot of fun. Um I'm excited to see what else will happen. And obviously, first of all, getting the first season done. And I think there's obviously a lot of work left to do, but production side of it is over. And I think we had a heck of a time all over the country. And, and as I, we've talked about it before, just, I can't emphasize it enough how different of each environment each episode will be just based on the people, the culture, the, the environment that they're based in. I think it's, it's just a very unique idea and it's a very unique sort of concept and I can't wait for people to to see some of that and uh, you know I personally can't wait to see it either yeah absolutely it's gonna be uh yeah it's gonna be cool to see them see everything edited together I mean we're taking you know several days you know worth of footage from four sometimes five sometimes six different cameras and and compiling it into you know a, a 30 40 minute show and it's yeah it's gonna be cool a lot of you know a lot of great uh, a lot of great stuff that we captured and a lot of great moments and great interviews, great people we talked to. It's going to be awesome to, uh, to see to, for everyone to see, you know, what we saw and, yeah, absolutely. you know, get to get a little bit, get a little taste of what we got to experience doing this yeah. show. Blue Daxi says, great show. Looking forward to seeing your work. Yeah. Looking forward to showing off. Yeah, guys, it's been awesome. We'll have to do another show like this, maybe uh, like a season one recap before it, it goes live or, you know, just do something along those lines um, when the time comes. So this won't be the last you'll be hearing from this crew. Obviously, uh, you know, my show is continuing, you know, we're going to have other stuff going on. Like I said, big month coming up. Uh, you know, we've got uh, Doug Heichek, the producer of uh, Monster Quest and lots of other Bigfoot related programming, Scott Martis, just a bunch of folks coming up on the program. So stay tuned for that. But aside from that, thank you everybody who commented, asked questions. Awesome to see that there was actually a lot of people from that area in Louisiana from yeah. Oh, know, yeah. South Louisiana. That was pretty cool. You guys have an amazing part of your world down there. Uh, we were glad to experience it and kind of check it out. Um, and, and as we said, Chasing Legends, follow Chasing Legends on Facebook and YouTube and stay tuned because we will, uh, we will definitely be posting some updates about that, but yeah, guys, thank you so much for coming on. Obviously. Yep. Oh, we had uh, Netherlands down there. Oh yeah. The no, yeah. We have, wow. we have people watching from all over the place, which I think is just so cool. So that's again, awesome. Thank you all to the listeners and thanks all of you guys chasing legends guys for coming on here. Looking forward to uh, further episodes and yeah, we'll talk to everybody. Hope everyone has a good rest of your week and we'll see you next Monday. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody. Thanks Bye -bye. for joining.